Well, it's a great pleasure and uh, honour to have a chance to talk to Don Cupid. Uh, Don, when and where were you born? I was born in 1934 at what was then called a maternity home in Oldham, Lancashire. My family was of the old Lancashire working class. One grandfather was a plumber and the other was a butcher. And uh, tell me something about your parents, um, both what they did and what their character yeah. was. My father was young, short, stocky, dark haired, the opposite of me physically, quite athletic, but had great driving energy. And even at the age of, at the time when I was born, he was directing large gangs of men laying gas mains, installing gas lighting and so on, gas heating systems around the country. Uh, he was evidently energetic and skilled as a manager, and that's what he became, a businessman, a, a metal basher. He ran a, um, a factory in Brentford, London, <coughs> and um, did rather well in the war, working enormously hard, producing the fuselages of warplanes and later landing ships. My mother, whose father was a butcher, um, worked for Singer sewing machines, um, but married at the age of 19, and I was born when she was 20. My parents were only 20 years older than I, so they died in the 90s. Um, but after the war, my father was earning quite a good income. Well, you were talking about which war at this time? After World War Two, sorry. <laughs> at the end of World War Two, my father was earning quite a good in income. And rather ambitiously, my parents decided to go in for private education for their four children. Mm. And by working extraordinarily hard, they put all four of us through um, expensive uh, private schools. Were you, and were you um, brothers or sisters, did you have? Yes, I had a brother who became mm. a chemical engineer mm. and two sisters who both became doctors. Mm. The boys went to Charterhouse and the girls to Cheltenham Ladies College. <laughs> So uh, my parents, by their lights, did their best for us, and that was the main work of their lives, I think. Mm. They were dedicated to their children. But a bit unhappy in our old age, partly because our education inevitably led us a bit away from them, mm. culturally. Mm. And also physically, because we went into the sort of careers which meant you lived a long way from your own hometown. Were you they, when you say they were from Lancashire, but they went to Brentford, they moved around the country during the war, especially, mm -hmm. yes. My father was very busy being a sheet metal engineer at that time. He was establishing factories that produced war materials. Mm -hmm. And one year, he, he would do this in six months or so, train the workers and set it all up, and move on to the next. And we moved house every six months during the war. That meant that the early years of the war, we were living in near Birmingham during the uh, raids there. In the last years of the war, we, we were living in West London at the time of the V1s and V2s. So I saw a bit of the war from the point of view as a, of a civilian as I was growing up. I remember actually hearing the first V2 land in Chiswick, he lived near there. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to a prep school down there and then on to public school. Tell me about the prep school. I mean, you went to a number, obviously, if you were moving south. Yes, we went to many different schools, yes. Uh, um, a rather ropey little preparatory school down in Gunnersbury, mm -hmm. just on the edge of the North Circular Road, mm -hmm. by Ealing, a bit south of Ealing Common, mm -hmm. near um, Acton Town Tube Station. <laughs> yes. So that's where I was at the age of 12 or so. Do you remember anything about that school? Were there any good teachers or anything? The only one I remember was an, Eng an English teacher, Hugo de Chanchif. Um He gave me a book called Dodd's Beauties of Shakespeare, uh, which he said was by the only clergyman ever to have been hanged. <laughs> I was impressed by that and have the book to this day. It's true, Dodd was the only clergyman of the Church of England ever to be hanged. Mm. <laughs> Um, well, you did otherwise, you have... I remember my mathematics master, uh, Mr. Blake, I remember that. He lived in Earl's Court in very great poverty, very old man who'd had to return to teaching because of poverty and the war, mm. with the younger teachers having gone off. Mm. A lot of older teachers came out of retirement. 
And I remember him trying to get some maths into my head and having a house in which electric lighting hadn't yet arrived. There was only a little gas lighting overhead. Um, I remember going to his house for extra lessons. Otherwise, there was nobody of note there, whereas, of course, at uh, my um, older school, the public school, there was a very high-class staff, indeed, of notable figures. Well, let's come to that in a moment. Um, you haven't said much about your mother. What sort of person was she? She was quiet, very dedicated to her children, good at the old Victorian virtues of make, do and mend. Um, making clothes, repairing clothes, and she simply toiled away domestically and was devoted to her children. She had only a few friends in her later years who tried to get her interested in the world, but I think outside a rather um, narrow family life, she didn't have many interests. It was a trouble to her. She was depressed in her last years. Mm. She'd not had enough education. Mm. My father had had at least night school and his work to educate him. My mother hadn't had that. It was an age when a lot of ordinary folk had good genes but poor educational opportunities. Did either, we're going to come to religion fairly soon, but did either of them have an interest in religion? No. No, my family was secular and I had no religious upbringing from them. The only near religious influence was that of my grandmother. Mm. My grandmother, Emma Cupid, E.H. Cupid, had got a scholarship as a girl to go to medical school from a poor family in Nottingham. The family wouldn't allow her to go because she was the oldest of 12 children and she had to stay home and help her mother to raise them. So all her life, she was drastically underrated, undereducated and frustrated about it. Uh, and she took up instead palmistry, tea leaves, divination from dreams, theosophy, and all sorts of more or less occult kinds of knowledge. And I remember her taking me to a spiritualist meeting once. So perhaps some, some interest in religion and a rather critical attitude to it owes something to her. The sense that uh, religion provided a sort of knowledge for people who haven't had the opportunity to encounter real knowledge. Did you go to table tapping? And, and I never attended a true seance, no, no. I, but I do remember the spiritualist meetings at which a medium would get up and claim after a while to be hearing voices coming through and it was a man, he had a dog, he had a pipe and very soon somebody would say, that's my Herbert <laughs> 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 and uh, he would sort of go on apparently giving information from the other side mm. and to me at the age of 10 or so it was obvious that this was a bit of a con in which everybody was complicit including the medium himself he was half taken in by his own line of patter so my religious uh, skepticism perhaps owes something to that early influence did, and did you have any particular hobbies or interests at that time? all my life I've had a succession of fads and crazes um, and I've picked up a lot of my general education simply by having been very keen on a subject for a short period. Um, an early one, for example, was butterflies. I collected them. I'm still a member of butterfly conservation to this day. It was one of the means by which I, I got into natural history and birds that I came became keen on too. Or I became very keen on Italian opera, um, uh, assembled a large collection of uh, pre-electric gramophone records and by that way learned something about music and even at Charterhouse got a master to teach me Italian. So and when did your interest in Italian opera start? What age were you? Twelve or so. Really? Oh. Yes. I remember before I was 13 I had read all Dickens too. I was a voracious reader from an early age. I used to haunt second-hand bookshops and bring home sixpenny copies of Victorian novels and such like things. I certainly had virtually the whole of everyone's library as a very small boy. So I was a, I was a furious reader from, from early on. I should think until I was 30 I probably read a novel a day in addition to academic reading. Good heavens. So, you were um, a very fast reader. That, uh, yes, but now I don't read novels. But in those days I was a very rapid, voracious reader. Yes, mm. and uh, I remember... We 
reading rapidly through with things like Proust and uh, Ballot, you know, mm -hmm. and, and learning a lot from it is the best way to learn the language of writing, just mm -hmm. by masses and masses of reading. We were lucky in that way. I think it, it was a better education than the modern child's equivalent thing, which is, which is having a really thorough knowledge of cinema. Mm -hmm. um, I've only got interested in cinema late in life. In my generation, television hadn't yet arrived, and it was the novel through which you basically learnt about the world. Did your parents encourage you in this reading? No, I just did it. Mm. Mm. And your sisters and brothers as well, or not? Did they the read? two sisters were, became quite senior doctors with good ability. Mm. Uh, my brother was, yeah, well, intelligent, you know, but uh, I wouldn't describe any of them as intellectuals and none of them publishers, mm. but they have had their careers and, uh, mm. and so on. But I was rather exceptional. I suppose, in being rather reflective and having a huge appetite for language and for the various fads and crazes I took up. I remember another one, architecture, which really started a school where I think my housemaster encouraged that by taking me church crawling. This is at Charterhouse? Yes, yeah. yes. But I've always been a Pevsnerite and uh, have had the up to latest volumes of the whole series as they've yeah. come out, as it were. And I've always liked architecture and mm. taken the pride in being able to read a city historically. Mm. Only very much more recently I learned from Hoskins and Oliver Rackham to read landscape in the same way. Mm. So let's now move on to Charterhouse. Um, tell me about your school days. Were they, were they pleasant or miserable? Or on the whole. Were you a boarder, by the way? Yes, no. I was a boarder. I won a foundation scholarship which helped pay the fees. It was in those days a large chunk of the fees. Um, and I remember the names of some of the other scholars. They drew some other people who became philosophers as well. Um, including Geoffrey Lloyd of this college. Oh, really? And uh, uh, I've interviewed Richard Jeffrey. Sarabji, Richard Swinburne, but people who became known as mm. philosophers. Um, yes. Um, I started reading general subjects and did eight A-levels and then switched to science mm. at uh, A-level. Um, there were some excellent people amongst the masters there who did influence me. Um, but I also did Want become aware of religion and religious thought at, at school. Can you name any of the teachers? Or do you remember any of Of the well-known ones, um, or whom I saw a lot of. Hmm. Richard Palunin, the botanist, a hmm. very eminent field botanist who wrote most of the standard books about the Himalayan flora. Hmm. Um, Wilfred Noyce, the hmm. poet mountaineer, hmm. who died in the Himalayas and uh, taught me Italian. Hmm. Um, Percy Chapman taught me zoology. Richard, um, sorry, Bob Arrowsmith was my housemaster, a well-known, mm. slightly eccentric schoolmaster, but very good on architecture. Uh, uh, but there were many talented and inter interesting characters. Uh, English, I was taught by W. C. C. Seller, famous as mm. the author of a book called 1066 and all that. Yes, and I remember the way he talked about Browning to this day. <laughs> and I still love Browning. Mm. Um, yes. Uh, the upper middle class world of school was strange to me at first, but I took to it culturally mm. and uh, you couldn't but admire and respect the masters, they were very high class people, mm. even if many of the boys were from very class conscious, well to do Surrey families who would not normally be my first choice of company. <laughs> were you bullied at all? or No, no. I was always physically large mm. and able to hold my own I suppose. Not particularly combative, but um, if I had the relics of a North Country accent, I no doubt lost it very quickly. I don't even remember it being a problem. Mm. And were you a games player? Only moderate. I think the only thing on which I kept in the school was chess. <laughs> but I was moderately good at soccer and at cross-country running. That's mm. all. Mm. Uh, coming up to the school to read, uh, to take my scholarship examinations in... June 47, I strayed out onto the cricket pitch and there I saw PBH May make 180 odd runs against Eton on the school cricket field. 
And that was the most physically beautiful display of sport I've ever seen by anybody. The young man he was a prodigious cricketer. Um, that's the only r really remarkable sporting memory I've got. Mm. But the beauty of his stroke plays was extraordinary. Mm. Mm. He was he became captain of England subsequently without having a, had a terrifically distinguished career. But as a young man, he was tremendous. Of course, the school in those days did have high class. Professionals, for example, the cricket professional was an England spin bowler called George Geary mm. from the 1930s. Mm. But I was no good at cricket. I quite like football. Mm. And what about music at this stage? Um, did no, you no. Oddly enough, I never had a decent musical education. I've regretted it ever since. So I picked up a little on my own, mm. but never learned to sing properly or to read music properly. Mm. So I, I ought to play an instrument. Mm. Yeah. But has music been important to you in your life? Not a major thing, no. I'm predominantly a verbal person. I'm an articulator, as it were, mm. I think. Um, no, um, a few years ago it seemed quite likely that my sight was deteriorating very badly and I would have to take up music and listen to it more. But just recently, surgery has improved my eyesight and I've had good news about it. So I expect I'll stick to the word for, from now on. Mm. Um, and with luck, my eyes will last me out. If they start to go really badly, I will have to have a music craze. Mm. The last music craze I had was for modern music. Ten years ago, twelve years ago, I remember I did, for a year or two, buy a lot of modern music and listen to it. Mm. Then it was Stravinsky and after, including a lot of modern minimalism and stuff like that. Mm. And were there, uh, you mentioned your crazes before, were there any other hobbies you were particularly, were you still continuing with your collecting of butterflies <laughs> or natural Railway history? engines, um, books, yes, and railway engines was another craze that all small boys had, but that was from an earlier age, mm. between about the ages of 8 and 11. Mm. I joined those small boys who knew their way through holes in the fence into every engine shed in London. <laughs> I were chased out by railroad from, from all these places. Uh, nine Elms, Neesden. I remember to this day the names of the great London engine sheds where enthusiastic small boys used to go carrying their copies of Ian Allen's guides mm. to the rolling stock of the great railway companies. You ticked every engine off as you've seen it. <laughs> um, Yes, railway engines were now an example of a craze, and from that, uh, getting interested in Victorian engineering, the heroic age of mm. British industry. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I love of uh, bridges and Brunel and such mm. things. Mm. Mm. And what about uh, things like drama and debating? I was not a performer as a boy, I don't think, so far as I remember. If I developed any ability to perform publicly, it was much later in life. Mm. I was probably too shy when young. I don't remember ever doing much in that line, no. I was, I was head of my house eventually in a school monitor and was seen when young as a potential leader, mm. as long as I was respectable. Mm. Other people saw me as a leader, but uh, that's all I remember. Mm. Um, to go forward a little bit until after school, as a national serviceman, I was best cadet of my year, despite being really not at all military. But I did have the air of a leader when young, mm. and I was no doubt expected to be a church leader uh, at one time, before it became clear that I was a baddie. <laughs> so that's perhaps where my talent was felt to lie. That's why I became so easily assimilated mm. into a higher class than I'd been born into. Mm. Um, it was felt that that was where I was actually heading. Mm. And what, uh, what were your political views then? Do you remember at all? When I first became very strongly Christian and practicing after my confirmation, I saw myself as a liberal Anglican Tory, a bit in the Harold Macmillan or Rab Butler style, mm. I think. Mm. I only became aware of being more socialist I would think in my 20s. I think when young I was attracted to readers and writers like Britton and Eliot and C.S. Lewis, those after World War II who still hoped it might be possible to reconstruct Christian Europe. 
so that I was only a Tory in the same in the sense that people on the continent were Christian Democrats. We, we wanted to reconstruct civil, Christian civilization because we looked at fascism and at communism. We didn't want either of those. And you probably remember exactly the same way. Mm. But in the 50s, many of us felt in the West it ought to be possible to rebuild a Christian society in England. Mm. Well, you mentioned there, after your confirmation, what age were you when you were confirmed? Fifteen. And it was after confirmation rather than before that you became... After confirmation, I became a weekly communicant mm. and sometimes went once during the week as well in the old chapel at Charter House, I remember. I was pretty devout around the ages of 15, 16. Then when I did a lot of Darwin and zoology, I drifted away from, from it and then returned to religion very sharply at 18 at Cambridge. Mm. So much of my time at school I was very interested in religion and in religious thought. The two great influences were Plato and Darwin. Um, I, I met Plato's Republic by reading it aloud with the headmaster in his study with the other school monitors. It was our induction into being leaders, um, platonic guardians. Uh, and I met Darwin through doing zoology. So Plato's top-down vision of the universe and Darwin's British empiricist bottom-up vision of the universe were in conflict within my mind from the age of 16, 17 onwards. So I knew that I was very religious by the time I was 15 or 16. I also knew that religious thought was going to trouble me within a year or two. Did, did you ever go to religious camps or anything at that no. age? Not at that age, not until I got to Cambridge. Mm. No, um, I wasn't touched by evangelical, um, twice-born Christianity mm. until I came up to Cambridge. Mm. And did you, at school, have any spiritual experiences? I mean, Yes, I've all my life been liable to religious experiences. Mm. I think caused by a kind of um, overspill of joy, often associated with a sense of sight and sunshine, brilliant light. Um, so I've, I've always had religious experience. When I was first converted, I remember what I took then to be an experience of God was a feeling of almost continuous warmth, curious sensation, which the mystics often report. And they link it with actual dilation of the capillaries, of course. Um, if you're a Tibetan uh, lama, one of your practical exams consists in drying out a damp sheet with your skin. Um, because you're so, you can meditate to the point when your capillaries dilate, your skin gets warm. Um, so your practical exam consists in drying out a sheet. But I knew what it was like to feel a sense of religious exaltation that made one physically warm. Um, I'm trying to think of school religious experiences. I remember the feelings were very strong. The earliest religious experience I actually put in my books were ones I had as an undergraduate in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. But as I say, they were usually extravertive and um, visual. Extravertive in the sense of that looking at something outside of myself and seeing it as being as brilliant as a painting by Vincent van Gogh. Um, a, a sort of uh, super real, super vivid sense of, of colour, of the brilliance of the world. In, in re some recent books I call that brightness. The, uh, the brilliance of the fact that our visual experience is more conscious than our other sensations. Um, and, and, and the, uh, when visual experience is at its most highly conscious, in fine weather, good eyesight, the world takes on a kind of glory. Um, now I think of it, uh, a lot of English poets describe it, don't they? And Traherne, Traherne. Yes. Wordsworth, those old people. And Gerard Manley Hopkins. Yes, yes. Glory be to God like, Yes, that's right. It's experiences like that that have been my most common religious experiences. Um, and I, st I still have that. I, I still have experiences of something like Protestant joy, mm. when the feeling of God's grace boils over in one's soul, and one feels the extraordinary sense of exaltation. Um, it's often associated with Methodist hymns, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and really, 
statue and poems about tabernacles and glory. <laughs> but I've, I've known that, and it's, I think it's an extinct kind of religious experience now, but I knew it when I was young. Mm. Let's, let's just finish on Charterhouse. Um, yeah. You said you started specialising in science. Yes. So you took uh, A-levels or... A-levels, botany, zoology, organic chemistry. Mm. Yes, yes. And uh, from there you... Did you try different universities or...? No, the, college, the school recommended me to try Trinity Hall, Cambridge. Mm. Uh, and I got an exhibition only at Trinity Hall to my disappointment and came up in 1952. Mm. Uh, but the exhibition was worth £100 or something, which in those days was a significant chunk of the fees. Mm. So it probably helped my parents. Mm. Um, and they were very pleased about it. Mm. Yes. In those days, Cambridge was simpler and less congested than now. And I do remember that every term, my father delivered me by car to Trinity Hall Porter's Lodge, Gosh. and unloaded the suitcase and drove his car out again. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't get anywhere near my car nowadays. Mm -hmm. But that was the old modern Cambridge. Today's Cambridge is postmodern. It's mm -hmm. Cambridge as the film industry would like to see it. Mm -hmm. But in those days, buses clanked in both directions down Trinity Street, mm -hmm. which was tarmac, not cobbled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Today's Cambridge is a fake um, postmodern uh, Cambridge as the media like to think of Cambridge as looking. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> But in those days, it was real Cambridge with sooty buildings and um, you could drive anywhere and, and cycle anywhere, and you did. Um, Do you remember the atmosphere when you came to Cambridge? I mean... Intellectual exhilaration, of course, um, and great freedom after school, where you, had, you were under discipline, you had strict a timetable. There was a great freedom of Cambridge, so to someone like me from a modest background, it was exciting. Mm -hmm. um, visually because of the beauty of the buildings, but above all intellectually because of the huge range of interesting people who were in all directions. Mm. So it, it was thrilling. Um, and I still say, I used to say that Cambridge was the best youth club in the world. Now I say that in many ways it's the best day centre for the elderly <laughs> because I'm a life fellow of my college. <laughs> Somehow Cambridge College manages to be both, both mm. a superb youth club and a superb day centre for the elderly. <laughs> So it's an environment I've enjoyed so much that I've really wanted to stay, I think. Mm. Mm. What, what was Trinity Hall like? Who was the master? Do you remember? Yes, yeah, a rather scandalous old bird called Daddy Dean, mm. uh, a professor of physiology, was it, or anatomy? Mm. One of the medical subjects. One of the very last professors to be appointed before the retiring age came in. He was already in his 80s. Don't you remember? He used to say, I'm already out of date, soon I'll be a scandal, and I pray God I may live to be an outrage. <laughs> and he did, more or less. <laughs> but he, he lived all to, to almost the end of his 80s. Mm. And by then, of course, the university was seeing a retiring age as inevitable. The best known of the fellows was Owen Chadwick, who was my supervisor was when he? I changed to theology. Mm. He was the dean of the college. Mm. Yes. Because I've interviewed him. Right? Yes. What was he like as a supervisor? Quiet, conscientious, and good, a good teacher. Very hardworking and serious-minded in his way. Amongst undergraduates, he, it was believed that he'd had a riotous past <laughs> when he had been a considerable rugby player. Mm -hmm. But when I came up as an undergraduate, Owen was already in his mid-thirties, sobering down. And everybody said he was going to be at least Archbishop of Canterbury and probably something much more important than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, amongst the fellows, Louis Clark of the Fitzwilliam Museum, uh, Ronald Fisher, the celebrated biologist. Um, Who you were talking about, he, he helped establish, was that R.A. Fisher? R.A. Fisher. Mm. I think the book's called The Mathematical Theory of Natural Selection, 1927. Mm. It's the book that saved Darwinism at a time when its intellectual prestige was rather low mm. because no answer to it had been found yet to the question of how mutations which are recessive could ever spread through a, pop a whole population um, because surely out of every four children only one would show the an advantageous mutation at most <laughs> and uh, but 
Fisher did the mathematics of natural selection and then people following in his footsteps have demonstrated by looking at big seabird populations mm -hmm. where you could chronicle every bird mm -hmm. uh, have shown how, how it works out. Mm -hmm. uh, but Sir Fisher was a, a considerable biologist. Of the other fellows, I remember Tony Tremlett, the chaplain, my director of studies, George Kenner, as, as a scientist. Um, Kenner had a big influence on me because he suggested that in my second year of Natural Sciences Part 1, I should do the history and philosophy of science, mm -hmm. which had just then begun as a Cambridge subject. Mm -hmm. And I did that, and that had a big influence on me because it would turn me to philosophy book and to seeing yeah. ideas as having a history. No, the Correct. lecturer in the history of science was Rupert Hall, oh, yes. who lectured on the 17th century and on the 19th century, really. Mm -hmm. And the philosopher of science was Russ Hansen, mm. who looked like young Orson Welles. Um, uh, he was a young American who had listened to Wittgenstein and the rather distinguished and promising young philosopher of science. Unhappily, he died prematurely and tragically mm. in a plane accident back in America where he went off to, to, to a chair without ever fulfilling his promise. But I did learn a lot from Russ Hansen because he introduced me to Wittgenstein's ideas and to the way I would come eventually to think in philosophy in 1953, when I was still barely 20. Mm. And you said that you also came to supervisions with a zoologist in King's. Yes, Clive Parry, who I think may have been deputy provost or something. In Donald, King. Parry. Donald, Donald Parry. Donald yes. Parry. Yeah. In, in this building, the Gibbs building in King's, yes. Mm. Um, my botany supervisor, I remember, was John Scott was the name, but I also met Max Waters mm. and yeah. Anna Bidder. Mm. Um, in organic chemistry, a chap called Saunders of Magdalen, mm. um, B.C. Saunders. In the history and philosophy of science, Hall and Hansen. I very, I well remember going to philosophy of science supervisions with Hansen, which were very exciting. He lived in those days just in a bed sitter in Parsons Court or somewhere. Mm. Cambridge was so short of accommodation, and underneath his bed was a large wooden box. One day he pulled it out and it was full of brass scientific instruments. This was the Whipple collection. This was the beginnings of the Whipple Museum of the History of Science, which now occupies three or four big rooms <laughs> in Free School Lane. But in those days, it was just Russ Hansen looking after a box of bits and pieces. <laughs> but we got them out and talked about them. And he was a delightful man. And um, I was very, very sorry to hear about his premature death. Mm. The one book he did publish was Patterns of Discovery. But one of the things he picked up from Wittgenstein, of course, was that seeing is already interpreted. Mm. To see something is to interpret it. Uh, that was leading away from pure empiricism. Mm. The eye doesn't just photograph the world, the eye interprets the world. We see something as something. Mm. Um, and I got interested through that um, through him in language and in interpretation and in the sort of post-empiricist kind of philosophy. I also learned, by the way, that science is a cultural activity and it has a history. A lot of scientists seem to think that scientific truth exists in a kind of sacred platonic world of its own, untouched by time and human interests and so on. Of course, that's not so. Mm. Scientific ideas reflect the society that produces them and they have a certain lifespan, after which they're no longer useful and are superseded by other ideas. So reading the history and philosophy of science was a very useful transitional subject when I turned to theology. Well, that leads to, you alluded before, that it was at Cambridge that you, your yeah. interest in religion revived. Yeah. Yes. And evangelical Christianity. I was, I, I, yes, I became an evangelical in my first term, at the end of term, and was caught up with them for about a year. Then I drifted away and went first rather liberal, then rather Anglo-Catholic. Who uh, among the evangelicals caught your attention? Was it a particular preacher or person? 
Why I was converted, I don't know. In retrospect, I suppose that on my f in my first few weeks in Cambridge, I was lonely and a bit vulnerable, and was taken along to the usual evangelical sermon on Sunday evenings in Holy Trinity Church, and was converted on the spot, and joined the evangelical group in college. Does this kick you? Yes. Hmm. Um, I began to feel they were too narrow almost immediately. And by the end of my first year, I'd broken away from them mm. and begun theological reading on my own. Mm. Um, by the end of my second year, I knew I wanted to be ordained. Uh, I was reading rather widely in theology and drifting away from science. So uh, that was it. Yes, it, it was rather surprising that the evangelicals should have uh, been the means of reviving my concern for religion. But it's often said that British theologians are, on the whole, evangelicals trying to work their way out of it <laughs> <laughs> without going to bleaky potty. <laughs> um, that may be true. Um, it's been a bit of a blight on the history of Cambridge and to some extent Oxford as well mm -hmm. that this has been such a prominent feature of the undergraduate religious scene for over a hundred years. Um, Does it start, I mean, the late... 19th century, um, I've forgotten the very famous Cambridge. Yeah, Bodhi and Sankey conducted an evangelical mission in Cambridge in the early 90s, and mm. from that, the Cambridge Intercollegiate Christian Union grew. Mm. In my undergraduate days, much of the university was very religious. The leader of Kikiwi, his guru, was Basil Atkinson, an under librarian at the university library, and he was the real organiser of. Uh, he was rather like a Victorian Calvinist. Mm. Um, it was a rather grim, puritanical kind of religion, but worst of all, it was totally anti-rational, as it still is to this day. Amazingly irrational. And uh, I quickly found it rather horrifying. I mm. simply could not make sense of the language you were required to use. I remember the name of the person, Simeon, Charles Simeon. Charles Simeon, yes. Was he an evangelical? Yes, there was a version of evangelicalism in Cambridge in the early 19th century, this yes. is long before, mm -hmm. um, deriving from the evangelical revival of, out of which the Wesleys came mm -hmm. in the early 18th century. So, and it's the equivalent of what on the continent is called pietism, mm -hmm. with an emphasis on personal experience and holiness of your personal life. In London, the Clapham sect evangelicals, of whom Wilberforce was a member, were very influential, doing good works, and you can't really call them irrational because they had a big influence on social ethics in the early 19th century. As, as did Clarkson that came Yes, of course, Clarkson, a very great man, yes. Well, Charles Simeon was vicar of Holy Trinity. Uh, there was that tradition of Cambridge evangelicalism, but it got its rather oppressive quality from the Americans, so mm. the very, very strong emphasis on conversion and the belief that Having become converted, you became an instant expert on everything. You now had the true godly point of view on all matters. Um, and before that, there'd also been a strong evangelical uh, missionizing. Yes. Because the Church Missionary Society and so on. Were yes, well, that's probably true. And as a lot of schools had East End missions, mm. and now I think of it, while at Charter House, I visited Charter House in Bermondsey. Uh, which was a school mission to the East End. This was almost a class mission. Boys of the well-to-do privileged classes went to take kids from the slums on camps and so on. It was meant to be some sort of religious content too, but uh, yes, rather well-meaning, but uh, fairly harmless, these missions were. There was Cambridge House in London too, wasn't there? But, um, yes. As an undergraduate, I remember going once on a hopping mission to Kent, where Cambridge undergraduates lived alongside hop pickers in the fields, and supposedly to talk to them about religion. <laughs> yes, I came eventually to see that as really inspired by class feelings that would be rather absurd, and uh, not something I wanted myself to be involved in. Were you, uh, were you put through this, I mean, I went through all this as well, yeah. to Oikyo and so on. Um, yeah. They were constantly asking you to let God into your life, you know. Yes. He was knocking on yes. your heart and yes. 
Um, <laughs> and you, you were to open the door and let him in, and then there'd be a moment when you felt him That's inside right. you. That's right. Yes, the, this had a sort of intellectually respectable origin. In the 1740s, when early British empiricism, uh, especially in the sciences, was at its height, there was a desire to show that religious beliefs could similarly be verified in personal experience. Mm. And that influenced the evangelical tradition of theology. Mm. It was claimed that you could have personal experiences that in detail verified your approximately Calvinist religious beliefs. Mm. That was that was the sort of respectable origin. It was a, a, a desire to claim that religious, religious experience could verify religious beliefs. Mm. Mm. Not true now, I think, obviously. Mm. By the 60s, certainly, people began to publish books saying that your religious beliefs shape the kind of experiences you have. Mm. And therefore, of course, your religious experiences verify your religious beliefs. Mm. Rather as... If somebody has a vision of the Virgin Mary, you can be pretty certain that that somebody is an adolescent Catholic girl and not a Muslim or, uh, uh, or a Chinese or something. You know, People have the beliefs that their religion, have the experiences that their religion leads them to have. And when people have a vision of the Virgin Mary, if you ask um, uh, the girl in question, how did you know it was the Virgin Mary? Uh, she would answer, well, she had on a blue cloak and a red gown as in she does in church, in the statues. Well, of course. <laughs> um, belief shapes experience. Um, I'd come to see that myself by the 50s, maybe, and, uh, and was unpersuaded by the argument. But that is why you, that such rationale as evangelicalism could claim had that origin. A taste and see, or whatever it is, uh, how gracious the Lord is, Experience will decide how blessed are they and only they who in his truth confide. Remember the hymn? Mm, yeah. There was that appeal to experience in an 18th century hymn. Um, but of course, today's evangelicalism, as um, promoted by Holy Trinity Church Brompton, isn't even that rational. It is hopeless, but very popular still. Mm -hmm. well, it seems uh, particularly interesting that uh, you were at Cambridge, which uh, yes. is associated with Darwin. You were doing natural science and yes. interest in biology. Yes. And Darwin had been one of your great heroes. Yes. Uh, and yet you were thinking of becoming um, ordained. Did you not yes. feel any conflict at that time? Uh, and the interest in religion was just stronger. It's true. I shared my rooms as an undergraduate for three years with Neil Alexander who became a celebrated professor of zoology at Leeds. I knew Jonathan Miller well, who became a doctor, and then, of course, a comedian and so on. Um, and I knew Francis Darwin, um, a great grandson. Yes, I had a lot of friends in the sciences. Um, so why did I go for ordination? Well, I suppose my religious thought and feeling was so strong at that age that ordination was what I wanted to do. I wanted to study theology. I had just off my own bat, got interested in a bit in Anglo-Catholic writing, a bit in Dean Ing and liberal Platonic Protestant writing, and quite a lot in the mystics. I was already reading the, the, the standard mystical writers you'd expect me to be able to pick up and getting interested in mysticism. Is, it, is this the, the Spanish or the English or the Italian? Yes. Um, English people, the cloud of unknowing, mm. Mother Julian, Marjorie Kemp, Walter Hilton. So um, they are English men. But also, but also St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila, and one or two Germans, but the most important of whom were Eckhart, mm. yes. Um, Weisbrock. Those were quite a lot read in those days, uh, but I did learn something from them, and I got a little bit of philosophy, Christian Platonism, from studying them, mm. yes. And this was my own spare time, amateur reading, while I was still trying to do adequately in science. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how did you end up in science? Did you... Um, no, I was a kind of two -two. Did you? Terrible. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. But I suppose we had given up doing it. And mm -hmm. by that time, I wanted to do theology. Mm -hmm. Did you... Uh, you mentioned one or two of your contemporaries. Was, uh, was Jonathan Miller your exact contemporary, or just a little... I remember him well, young and red-haired, um, 
gawky and looking at them a bit like me. Do you know? <laughs> so this was the great uh, time of drama in, in Cambridge too? Yes, yes. yes, they didn't know any of those people at all, it's funny. Yeah. But they operated in an English faculty for the world that uh, wasn't our concern. Was Raymond but Williams? I knew, I knew everybody in the college, you know mm. how intensely sociable Cambridge was in those days. I do remember that in my second year I knew every other undergraduate in the college. And it was just, we were very tightly sociable and uh, you never let a cup of tea pass without sharing with somebody. You know. mm. yes. But I didn't know the uh, coming celebrities of the footlights and so on now. Mm. The only one I met was Jonathan Miller because he'd been at the same school as my roommate. Mm. Mm. So having got a 2-2, um, yeah. You weren't going to go and do research in natural science. No, two two part one. Part one. Yes. Ah. See. And then I changed the theology. It's a two year part one. Yes. Yeah. I just did the two year part one. I see. And then you changed the theology. Yes. And who, who influenced you there? Owen Chadwick was my director of studies now, and taught me nineteenth century church history and was encouraging. Um, George Woods taught me the philosophy of religion. He was dean at Downing. Mm. He was a, a moderate English philosopher of religion in approximately the tradition of William Paley and Bishop mm. Butler. Mm. I am a Cambridge latitudinarian, he said to me, <laughs> uh, which he was. Um, Old Testament, New Testament, early church history, fairly routine stuff, but I, I read it eagerly. The part 1A syllabus was very demanding. Uh, you were doing almost a whole of part 2, certainly five papers, um, five substantial papers. But um, I enjoyed doing it. I perhaps crammed too hard and worked too hard, but I enjoyed doing it. Mm. What about the beauty of holiness? Were you going to King's and other chapels? Or? Yes, I attended King's most weekdays mm. at 5.30, mm. even some. My room was on the corner and I saw the chapel and heard it from my rooms in Trinity Hall at the front, looking mm. onto the little street. Mm. Um, so I was very frequently in King's and in Trinity Hall Chapel. Mm. Uh, so I was very churchy, very absorbed in religion as an undergraduate, I suppose. Yes. Mm. What about women? No, I, uh, somehow I wasn't ready yet. I mean, I, um, some chaps were notoriously good at girls and you could always meet Gotemians by getting to their rooms. I remember a friend, one friend of mine somehow made friends with women, great numbers, very easily. And his rooms were always full of girls from Gotham. Um, so that was where you went to meet girls from Gotham. And a few of those I remained in touch with for mm. many years, mm. but I didn't actually have any regular relationship with any particular mm. uh, young woman at that age, no. Perhaps I just wasn't ready for it. Perhaps my own mental uh, development was all absorbing really, I was mm. preoccupied with that. Mm. George Woods once took me aside um, and said, remember not to allow them to keep you so busy that you forget to get around to getting married. I much regret that I never did. And uh, it was good advice uh, from George, but he, he felt that um, being ordained and then becoming a Cambridge Don and a lecturer and the very heavy pastoral responsibilities in the college meant that you worked seven days a week and there was always work to do and somehow you never got round to getting married. <laughs> so George was warning me that I must, mustn't make that mistake. Advice you took, I hope? Of course, yes. yes we'll yes. come to your... But not till 29, uh, some years later. Mm. Right, well, uh, you finished your part, uh, you did a, a, a part 1A... Part 1A theology, yes, mm. yes. Again, they did very badly. I got to 2 1, and mm. not a first. But Owen Chadwick encouraged me and said he thought they might have a future in theology. And then uh, I also got a place at Westcott House to be trained for the ministry. Uh, but uh, before that, I had at last to do my military service. Mm. I was 21, just graduated, with what the army saw as a science degree. So within days of my getting my degree, I was required to present myself at Catholic camp mm. and join the Royal Signals. Catholic? In Richmond, North Yorkshire. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I thought I yes. had it right. Yeah. yeah. Um, was that a sobering experience or? 
Not too bad. Having been at boarding school and so on, the hardship of the army wasn't, wasn't all that strange. Mm -hmm. um, I had been at a very expensive boarding school which had no central heating. And uh, you got up and washed in cold water in the depth of winter. You were required to have your window open at night and at boarding school. I remember the frost on one's blankets in the morning. So the hardships of boarding school and its discipline made the army seem quite easy. <laughs> and curiously, um, public school boys like me found basic training in the army uh, less harsh and, and alarming than the ordinary kids from, from cities in the north who uh, had never been away from their mums before. And for them, it must have been a terrible ordeal. Some of them sobbed themselves to sleep at night. We could take it easily. We knew about this kind of thing. Our parents have paid for us to have a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember being pretty depressed some morning with Catholic, Catholic saying, I've got to do two years of everything. I'm so busy, I've got so much I want to do. Um, and uh, the idea of losing two years of one's life, uh, perhaps quite unnecessarily, was, was depressing, but one had to do it in those days. The whole culture was much more militarised than people can imagine nowadays. Mm. You grew up in a war memorial chapel, in institutions which have seen whole generations of kids sacrificed to the war, uh, believing that it was a good and sweet thing to die for your country and you might be called upon to do it. Uh, to an extent which nowadays people have no idea of. We, we now live in a civilian culture and the old military values mean nothing anymore. Really. You sound regretful about this. No, um, I, w I wasn't quite pacifism, I was fairly near to it, I hated military service really. I, I, I was able to profit a little from it, but um, I, suppose I did believe that the Second World War had been a just cause. I suppose all my life I thought the First World War was a catastrophe, it should never have happened. And we were as much at fault as anyone else. Whereas the Second World War was a war that had to be fought, it was necessary to defeat fascism. Um, but the colonial stuff that followed, uh, and the gradual rundown of the British Empire, was a pretty untidy business. Um, I got sent out to Cyprus, but I was able to take along with me a lot of philosophy books and I managed to keep up reading throughout the period of military service, particularly in philosophy. It's odd because I think that is what Geoffrey Lloyd did, uh, who you mentioned. Uh, yes. He was about. He went to Cyprus, I think, possibly. Yes, yes. And took out uh, quite a lot of books. He, such as you could pack in with your um, troops' uh, stores. That's what I did. Uh, they were in a box labelled essential equipment or something. I managed to take out 50 or 60 philosophy books, including the whole of the Penguin Philosophy series, remember, mm -hmm. that came out in the 50s. Um, so I read those and got a basic knowledge of the history of philosophy firmly in my head by reading and reading reading books while sitting in ridiculously hot conditions uh, in Cyprus. But uh, the army was quite kind in its way. I passed out of officer training with credit. <laughs> Top funny. cadet, you said. Top it, cadet. <laughs> <laughs> I even won heavyweight boxing. <laughs> but that was only because my opponent scratched, he'd injured himself or something. He was a terrible slogger. Um, but, you know, maybe I survived Cyprus and uh, uh, look forward to getting back to Cambridge after being demobbed in 57. Mm. We were one of the last generations to do it. I've talked with Bruce Kent, I think he was one two years later than I, mm -hmm. about his experience of the same thing, of having to do national service in the time, in the days when the empire was being wound down mm. rather quickly. I coincided with the Suez invasion, of course. Mm. My um, signal troop was attached to a gunner regiment, which was sent out to Cyprus to relieve commandos who went into Suez. What a waste of time that was. Did you remember, do you remember what your feelings about Suez were at the time? A little bit of alarm. I remember um, the fear of nuclear war for a few days at uh, that time, when Khrushchev was making very threatening noises, 
the Americans flatly refused to support Eden mm. and the French. And it became clear that we were in trouble and on our own. And the Americans were not protected. They thought the whole adventure was misconceived, mm. which it was. Mm. It was a catastrophic mistake. I suppose it was a bit of a disaster for the old Conservative Party and its values, the whole mm. thing. Mm. Um, you could no longer believe in their wisdom, really, if they could make such a dreadful mistake. Um, Anthony Eden had been the coming man of British politics, a darling of the English middle classes. He waited decades to become leader of the Tory party and prime minister, and then he made such a hash of it. I won't think of any contemporary echoes of that, but uh, <laughs> it was a catastrophe at the time for him. Mm. So let's bring you back to Cambridge and Westcott House. What, yeah. what was, was that a good experience? Yes, I was sent back to Trinity Hall um, for my studies to do part three in the philosophy of religion. Um, and this was a postgraduate qualification in those days. Uh, for that I returned to George Woods. So my first year was spent mainly on working very hard. And in that, at last, I got a decent first. Mm -hmm. At last. And then people began to say to me, you're probably pressed to take, a, take an undergraduate, an academic career. Um, but the principal of Westcott House also asked me to promise to be vice principal there when called upon. Um, Who was the principal? Kenneth Carey of an old Victorian family who became Bishop of Edinburgh. Um, the Vice Principal was John Habgood, who became mm. Archbishop of York. The previous Vice Principal was Bob Runcie, mm. who became Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, it was in those days uh, a strong um, liberal Anglican, slightly high, but basically liberal Anglican college with rather high class student intake, good people and rather nice. Um, it had been a bit left wing in the 1930s. The little anecdote from the 30s relates that Joe Needham, a celebrated biochemist, communist and, and sinologist, was one of those who went on a coach every Sunday morning from Westcott House down to Thaxted where the celebrated communist Conrad Noel was the vicar. The great English stronghold of communist Anglo-Catholicism. A lot of Westcott House people were keen on that. <laughs> they organised a coach down there. I suppose these were people who, who could still see in communism a little bit of the kingdom of God on earth mm. and who wanted to change English society mm. and to break completely with the old pre-war class society and make a new and better England. And they were genuine patriots and quite Tories in some ways. But they changed their Victorian ne neo medievalism into um, a modern Christian socialism. And it wasn't such a big shift as you may imagine. And where did the famous Cambridge spies fit into all this? None of them were connected with the church, no. no. Because they were also, to a certain extent, idealists who had been. Yes, I think that was so, yes. If you think of William Morris, mm. there were connections between Victorian medievalism and socialism. People mm. often forget that. Yes. Mm. But Ruskin and Morris and those were people were like that. Mm. Uh, nowadays, there's much indignation that Cambridge chaps could have got mixed up with such dreadful things, but it didn't seem like that at the time. Mm. Um, Victorian social concern morphed over the generations into sympathy for far left ideas about rebuilding society. Mm. Perhaps I was turned in a socialist direction a little bit myself while at Westcott House. Um, and no longer Tories, rather uh, we believed in the welfare state and things like that. Of course mm. we did. Mm. You were talking about the welfare state and how what an important um, moment it was when Bevan introduced that. Yes, I noticed uh, see, living through that Attlee government in the years after the war, I noticed the hatred of the conservative press for the Attlee government and its achievements, but also the stupendous achievement of men like Nairn Bevan, who 
spent six months in the teeth of fierce opposition from the medical profession, from hospital boards, from the press, from the Tory party and so on, managed to get the National Health Service established and within two or three years saw a spectacular improvement in public health for the population. It was a stupendous achievement. Uh, this may one believe that social reform really could transform society. Um, it's hard to remember now that you can't make a film about the Second World War using original uniforms because people are a size bigger now than they were then. Uh, the, the health and appearance of populations could change completely since um, the 40s. Um, that, that was a marvellous achievement. So we really believed that Christian ethics could build a better society and the Labour Party was the right vehicle for it. Um, another example of this was my friend Ralph Lapwood, a fellow of Emmanuel, who was with Chairman Mao on the Long March and was also a perfectly straightforward English free churchman and a good mathematician, academic mathematician. Mm. He reminded one of the ease with which uh, a well-intentioned uh, person of that period could combine communism with Christianity, of course. Why not? He took both seriously. Uh, projects for making a better world. So the, the profound disillusionment with um, communism and even Maoism as well that occurred during the 60s um, has coloured our recollection of the earlier period when you could see in, uh, at its best in, in socialism uh, a project for realising the Christian gospel on earth. <laughs>